All right. Well, Frank is back. Some of you have not met Frank. Meet Frank. This is Frank. Frank Stein. Frank Stein, yes. His middle initial is N. And uh, Frank was here this summer for a message and helped us understand uh, a very deep theological truth this summer. And he's been studying 1 John with you. And so he asked if he could come again and uh, help us through this morning's lesson. Um, Frank uh, is tired of living in the garage, and so he is excited to be here today to get plugged in to Rose Drive Friends Church. Oh, just a minute. Some of you have been asking about Frank. It demonstrates what a loving, caring congregation you are. Appreciate that. Several of you have been wondering about him. He's been, he's been a little lonely. He's been struggling in some areas. Um, so we're, help, we're trying to help him out. You know, uh, our, our kids have moved out now, so this is how we entertain ourselves <laughs> in our house. Brought him out of the garage, and Kim said, hey, we could, we could put him in the Halloween display. And then she said, we could put him in the Christmas nativity scene. He could be frankincense. <laughs> no lie, you can't teach that. That's, that's true. So um, Frank has been, uh, uh, Frank this summer helped us unpack a passage from Colossians. And, uh, and I think it was effective, so we're going to try it again today for 1 John chapter 3. So keep your Bibles out. 1 John 3. We're not going to put the scripture up on the screen. You're going to have to follow along in either on your phone or your tablet or that book that's in the pew rack there that says Bible. And I think 1 John is on 856. Is that right? Thanks. So follow along because that's where you're going to need to look as we work through the whole chapter of 1 John. But this summer, Frank helped us understand that when we are born, we are born dead red. The, the, the light in the center refers to like our inside, our inner spirit. And when we're born, we're born dead red. And by that I mean we're born separated from God. We're born disconnected from God. We don't have a living relationship with God. We're born uh, self-centered. We're born rebellious. We're born self-reliant. It's all about us. And, and God has no part in our lives when we're born. Now, it's, it's, a, it's an important theological truth for us to remember that though we were born that way, that was not God's design. God designed us as human beings to live in, in relationship with him, in perfect harmony with him. But because we are born into a sin, into a world that is fractured by sin, that's infected by sin, all of us are born broken. We're born separated from God and God's ways, okay? And because of that, not only are we, are we born dead red on the inside, but our lives then are also an outward reflection of that same sin. So outwardly, our actions and our behaviors and our attitudes and our language and our thoughts are all also dead red in, in, re, in response to what, what we are born with, how we are born. And then we grow up in a world that also reinforces all of the self-centeredness and all of the separation from God. And so it just becomes more and more a part of who we are until, until we come to God. And, and, and a, in, a, in a convergence, a really a miraculous convergence of God's grace and our faith, then we come to life inside from red to green. We are born, the Bible uses a variety of metaphors to talk about it, brought to life spiritually, born again, uh, but the, the, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us. And this then becomes our new reality. If we've said yes to Jesus, if you said yes to Jesus this morning, then, then your reality is the core of who you are has been changed from red to green, from sin, from darkness to light, from sin to life. And that's what we've been 
singing about and worshiping about this morning. But here's the challenge. Because we are shaped and conformed by the world around us, which continues to try to draw us away from God, we continue to live on the outside patterns and behaviors that reflect our old ways, our old life. And so we want, as Christians, we want to begin to change on the inside, from the inside out and begin to turn green on the outside. But in reality, we often end up sort of in this confused place of I want to do what I don't want to do and I do what I don't want to do and it's this it's not how God designed it and so in in the body of Christ we work we're working always in the great in the power of the grace of God to begin to let him transform our mind our hearts our language our attitudes our behaviors so that the outside reflects the inside So this Christian life then is this process of living from the inside out, becoming on the outside who what is true of us on the inside. And the and the chapter in 1 John 3 teaches us this truth again from a different perspective and a little different paradigm. So if you have 1 John 3, look again with me at verse 1. Heidi read the first three verses. The verse first one is the foundation. Verse 1 may be the most important verse in the whole letter of 1 John. And I love this verse. This verse has become uh, uh, significant for me. I've memorized it. I want to invite you to maybe memorize this one verse. When I get discouraged, when I question who I am, when I'm confused, I'll often go back to this verse and and meditate and think about the truth of this this passage, this verse, chapter 3, verse 1. So look at it. The first word in some translations is see. In the old King James, it's behold. It's a word that is an exclamatory word. The the, the New International Version that most of us use just says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us. But that first word, see, is is an exclamation. The The writer throws this word in, and translators don't know exactly what to do with it. Do we, do we set it apart with its own exclamation point? Do we just include it in the sentence? But, but he's trying to get our attention to say, hey, hey, behold, see, pay attention. I, I, have, a, I have a friend who uses the, the little phrase, look it. Look it. Look it, John is saying. Look it. He's trying to get our attention here. Because what I have to say next is powerful. And so I want, us to, I want to read that verse again and just listen to this. Maybe just close your eyes and, and listen to the truth of this passage. See, look it, behold, pay attention. What great love the Father has lavished on us that we, might, that we should be called children of of God. And that is what we are. Man, that's a great verse. Anybody say amen to that? You know what? Underline that in your Bible. Um, Underline it in the pew Bible that's in front of you, even if you're not looking at it. Uh, On your phones, highlight it. You know how to do that. Highlight it in your tablets. In fact, you know what? Why don't you tweet it? And post it. Let's see how many posts and tweets of 1 John 3, 1 we can put out on the web today. Wouldn't that be cool? It's just such a powerful truth. And if you forget any, everything today, if you forget everything else, remember this verse that, that God has called us. I mean, these are deep words. The series on 1 John we're calling deep, the deep, because this is a deep truth. How deep the Father's love. And the word lavish is a deep word. I love that word. God has lavished like Someone who's so generous, lavishing us with complimentary words or with extravagant gifts or somebody gave you a day at the spa. I mean, this is such a great word. God has lavished on us that we might be called children of God. Now, what I want to do with 1 John 3 here is I want to look at it in the framework of what is our reality and then what is our response? 
What is our reality and what is our response? And we're going to let Frank's inward light represent reality, Frank's reality. And our, uh, the outside of Frank is going to represent the response. So what is our reality and how do we respond? And by the way, this is a great way to always read the Bible. If you're figuring, trying to figure out how to make sense of the Bible, read through it and maybe make a list. Is the Bible talking about my reality or is it talking about my response to reality? What is reality, and how do we respond to reality? So our reality is right here in verse 1. God has called us children, sons and daughters. We are adopted into his family. And I, I love that image of adoption because I am adopted. I, some of you know I'm a Wachemeyer, but I was not born a Wachemeyer. But by my parents' welcoming open arms, I was adopted into the Wachemeyer family. And I've, fortunately, I've been able to spend almost all of my life as a Wachemeyer. But I didn't deserve it. I didn't earn it. I wasn't born that way. It was an embracing, welcoming mom and dad that said, now you who, was, who were not born into this family. Now you have all the rights and responsibilities of a Wachemeyer. And I live carrying that name proudly because of their grace, their gift to me. And so I love the image, the biblical image of adoption, because all of us have been adopted into God's family. We weren't born into his family. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. We were born separated and apart from him and yet by his grace he's adopted us in and now now our response then is to live out the reality of being a child of God so let's look then at the rest of this chapter and I'm going to work through it fairly quickly because it's a long chapter and and look at how we are to respond to our reality if our reality is we're God's children what is our response? First of all, look at verse 2. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know, we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. So the first response is that children of God are in the maturing process. John says in, chapter, in verse 2, what we will be has not been made known. Now I find comfort in the truth there that I'm, I'm not done. God is not done with me. I'm still in the process of maturing. I, I'm not what I once was, but I'm not yet what? He will make me to be. And the hope then here is when Christ appears, this will be made complete. It, when Christ appears, we will be fully green. Green on the inside, green on the outside. In the meantime, I'm green on the inside, and I'm, I'm shades of green, and, and sometimes shades of red, and then back to green on the outside. But as children, as a child, I'm still learning to resemble my father i'm still learning to to model my life after my father you know my um my own parents have been wonderful examples to me of what it means and i uh, i i i strive to model my character after them and sometimes kim will say to me oh you just like your dad Oh, oh, you just said that. You sounded just like your dad. And I sometimes catch myself and go, oh, that was my dad or that was my mom. And I'm, yet, I'm, not, not, I'm not biologically their son, and yet because of their influence in my life, I begin to resemble them in my actions and my behavior and hopefully in my character. That's the same with children of God. We, we, we won't look like God, but we trust that as we spend time with him and let him shape us and influence us, our behavior will resemble our Heavenly Father, and our character will resemble our Heavenly Father so that we begin to reflect 
green on the outside, the same as we were, as it's true about us on the inside. But we're still in the process. We're still putting away childish things. We're still doing what Dave talked about last week, learning how not to love the world, not to, to be attracted or to set our affections on the things that are red, but instead to set our minds and our hearts on Christ. So our first response to being a child of God is to recognize that we're children and we're still in process. The second response to being a child of God is that children reflect the holiness of their father. Verse 3, all who have this hope in him purify themselves. All who have the hope, the hope of Christ's coming, the hopes of final maturation, the hope that we will someday be complete. What do we do knowing that we have that hope? We begin to live that out today. We begin to, to let the Lord change us from within today. And then John goes into this long explanation about a sin and the law. So look at verse 4. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. So, so he's saying here that sin is rebellion. If you're, if you're living a life of sin, you're in rebellion against God. But we're called to reflect God. And so there the good news comes in verse 5. But you know that he, Christ, appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. That's the good news. Jesus breaks the power of sin. Jesus not only forgives and turns our, our reality from red to green, from dead to life, but he begins the process of transforming us from the inside out. He breaks the power of temptation. He breaks the power, the enslavement of sin. Now, follow me, follow me here because it gets a little complex. So look at verse 6. No one who lives in him, in Christ, keeps on sinning. Whoa. Okay, hang with me. Let me finish this paragraph and then I'll come back. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. In other words, don't be deceived. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. The one who does what is sinful is of the devil. In other words, you're reflecting your old family, your old life, because the devil, your old family, has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. No one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in them. They cannot go on sinning because they have been born of God. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child. Okay, now listen. This is a delicate theological paragraph. There's some hard stuff here. And I don't want you to fall on either side of this sort of this theological precipice. On one side, some, some of us fall on this, the side that we, we've, you know, if I sin, I'm no, no longer a Christian. I can't be a Christian unless I'm perfect. On the other side of this precipice are those who go, ah, I just sin all the time. Just sin all the time. Thought, word, and deed. That's just who I am. I can't help it. This verse actually brings us to this this balance between those where we go, okay, it does, it, the Scripture does not say that we will never sin again. In fact, 1 John 1, 9 says, if you sin, you confess your sin, and He will be faithful to forgive you and to cleanse you from unrighteousness. But what this passage is saying is that those who are children of God, who are in the maturing process, no longer continue in the same old patterns of sin. This passage is all about continuing and patterns and persistence. So that so that we as children of God, we don't continue the same lifestyle that we lived before when we were not children of God. We are in the process of being changed. And and it's it's he's really challenging our attitude towards sin. He's saying, look, as your as your children of God, you should not expect to sin. And you should not accept sin. Now, when you do sin, there's, there's forgiveness and there's grace, as he said in 1 John 1, 9. 
But, but sin should never be something we're happy with or content with. Sin should repulse us. When we do sin, we ought to go, whoa, that is not me. That is my old Kent. That's my old Frank. That is not who I am. Instead of simply being satisfied with, ah, it's just the way I am. That is not true of you. You are a child of God. You're in a new family. You've been, your, your, your slavery to sin has been broken. So that's what he's saying here. You don't continue to persist in the same kind of patterns of sin. That has been broken by God's grace in Christ's blood. So, so our response, our attitude to sin is, whoa, that, that's, not, that's not me. That's not right. That's someone else. That's the old me. So we're redeemed from our old life. Now, one of the marks of holiness is love, and that's where John goes next. So look at the next, the end of that verse, end of verse 10. He says, anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. One of the clear marks of holiness is love. And if you're not not sure if you're um, growing in holiness or not, check your love. Are you growing in love for God? Are you growing in love for one another? Children of God reflect the love of their Father. And that's what he says, verse 11, for this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Loving one another is, is, is the, the mark of holiness. I know some of us grew up in holiness churches. I grew up in a holiness church, and we were, we were trained often to look at lists to determine if we were holiness. I don't do anything on this list, and I make sure I do everything on this list. And so holiness became this process of checking the lists of things I'm supposed to do and things I'm not supposed to do. But, but what John is saying here is if you want to follow the path of holiness, follow the path of love. Love for God and love for one another. And then he uses a, a, a negative example before he uses a positive example. So first the negative example in verse 12. Don't be like Cain. Now, if Cain, is, Cain and Abel were the two, first two brothers in the Bible, and Cain reflected a heart against God, a heart of rebellion. And so he says in 12, do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Cain murdered his brother, Abel, because his heart was not right. Actually, if you notice the same pattern here, it says that Cain was a murderer because of his heart, because he was set against God. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised. And John talks a little bit about the conflict we face face in the world. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you as Cain hated Abel. Verse 14, we know that we have passed from death to life, from red to green, because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. Hard words. Hate? Murder? But John's trying to point out the seriousness of sin. And he's really repeating what Jesus said in Matthew when Jesus said, you know, if your heart is, is hateful toward another, you're guilty of the same sin as if you had murdered. These are, these are uh, very hard words. But we're to recognize that as children of God, we're to live out a different kind of life. To reflect green on the outside as we are on the inside. Dear children. Oh, then he gets very specific about how you love. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This gets very practical. You want to be holy? Live in love. You want to know if you're living in love? Do you, do you recognize people around you? Do you see needs around you? And are you willing to sacrifice what you have For them, as Jesus did, sacrificed his own life. This is really rubber meets the road. 
Are you living the kind of life that reflects the heart of Jesus? That's what John's saying. So back to our reality. Our reality is this. We are children of God. If you take anything away today, take that reality. We are children of God. If you've said yes to Jesus, if you've trusted him with your life, you're his child. You've inherited the name. And the end of this passage speaks to the condition that some of us find ourselves in of uncertainty. I'm not sure. What if I don't know? I don't feel like a child of God. What do I do with that? And there are some hints in this last paragraph. So look at verse 19. This is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts. And he knows everything. If our If our hearts are uncertain, if our hearts are not at rest, if you're here this morning and you say, I'm not sure, my heart is not at rest, then it says clearly this, verse verse 19, the first word, this is how we know. We look back up into the passage, this. Are we living out a life of holiness? Are we living out a life of love? Is our love reflected in the way we treat people? That's one of the evidences. And when you're unsure, you look and you say, am I a more loving person than I used to be? But then he says, if our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. So we don't trust our emotions. We don't trust our feelings about this. We trust what God says. We trust God who knows everything. And if God says you are his child, if God has adopted you into his family, even if you're unsure, if you don't feel it, you trust what God says is true about you. We don't look to see if we feel secure. We don't look to our hearts. We look to God's truth. See, God is the one who has declared, you're my children. I didn't declare that. Now, in faith, I responded. God God never forces us into his family. God never says, in here. God always invites. And, And John 1 says, you know, if we believe, then we have the inheritance of being his children. But once we've responded to God's invitation, then we trust what God says is true about us, that we are his children. Verse 21, let me finish the chapter. If if our hearts do not condemn us, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we we have confidence before God and we receive from him anything we ask because, because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. That's the reflection of a child, child of God. Verse 23, and this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. The spirit that God gives us is not a feeling. It's a gift. It's a gift, promise, that God promises. Ephesians 1 says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession. So if you are unsure, remember God has given you a deposit, a guarantee, and that is his Holy Spirit that takes up residence in you, that turned you from red to green. Now, I realize that, that you may be here and you're, you're, not, you're a person who's never said yes to God. You would say, I, I've never considered myself a child of God. I've, this is all strange and unusual language to me, and I've never responded in that way. Then this is a great morning for you. This is a morning for you to say yes, because God has invited all of us into his family to receive his grace and his forgiveness. And, and so this is a great morning. And I'm going to give you something to do. I'm actually, I'm going to give you all something to do. I'm going to, I'm going to give us all an invitation to, to publicly declare our identity today. We're going to, in just a minute, we're going to watch a video of a song, a music video. And I'm going to invite you to come to one of the tables. There's four here and there's two in the back. And there are name tags that declare, hello, my name is. 
And I want to invite you to come and write on the name tag, Child of God. That, that you're going to publicly declare today, I'm a part of the family of God with Frank and with Kent and with each other. And for many of you, you you're, you're confident in this, you're assured in this, uh, but, but if this is if this is someone's first time to say, yes, I want to declare that I, I, this is me, I, I want my identity to be a child of God. I want no longer my identity, my identity to be my old life, my past. I want my identity from this day forward to be child of God. Then I'm going to invite you to come and talk to me after the service or talk to one of the staff or talk to somebody that you trust and love. And anyone at any of those three red tents out there would love also to talk to you. But, but if it's your first time to declare, I am a child of God, I no longer want to identify with my past, I want to be a child of God, then please don't leave campus today before you tell somebody that and let somebody encourage you and pray for you. Okay? So for the next several minutes, uh, watch the video, listen to the song, get up and enjoy. Now, there, uh, do we have enough? Do you think we have enough? We have enough? Okay, Chris assures me we have enough name tags. For starters, take one. If they're, at the end of the service, I'll tell you what to do if there's still name tags left over. But let's pray together, and then I want to give you about three minutes while this song is going on to make a public declaration. Oh, if you're here and you, you, you're unable to come or you don't want to come, there will be ushers walking the aisles with name tags, and they would be glad to hand you one. Now, you won't get the same markers. You can use the ballpoint pens that are in the pews, but they also will have name tags for you if you just get the attention of an usher, um, and they can hand you a name tag. Pray with me. Oh, great, loving Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace that welcomes us into your family. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we might be children of God. Thank you that you have forgiven our old lives, our old identities, and you've called us your sons and daughters, not by what we deserve or the way we were born, but simply by your grace, O oh God. And as we together here, brothers and sisters in this room, as we declare this to you, O oh God, we, we, we make this public step as an act of worship, as an act of declaration that we are your children. We love you. We thank you, O oh God, for loving us so much. In Jesus' name, amen.